team. The first three are all at the same thing. Yeah. So we're talking about a different kind of remote monitoring device for something a little larger. Um, and in our device, um, we were essentially looking at the idea of monitoring invasive crayfish um, and kind of thinking about a remote monitoring device that can help monitor free swimming aquatic invasive species. And we're good. And this is our team. It's been really wonderful to work with everyone and learn from their different areas of expertise. And yeah, she was going to start with why we became interested in this problem in the first place. Yep. The motivation of our project is let's farm crayfish, uh, one of the major spe uh, invasive species in my home country, Japan. And historically, they introduced by uh, US in uh, 1927 and now competing with the native uh, crayfish species and as, uh, other species. And since they have high adaptability and reproducibility, now they are found everywhere in Japan and now classified as a designated invasive alien species in Japan. And this invasive crayfish has a significant negative impact in multiple perspectives. And from ecological point of view, uh, they cause the habitat change uh, by damaging the underwater plant, uh, which is important for other aquatic species and it conse consequently affecting the economy such as fishery and agriculture. And not only they are destroying the habitat, but they're also killing the pathogen that, that's so harmful for to other uh, aquatic, uh, aquatic species. And due to their nationwide spread, um, ironically, uh, now most people in Japan uh, enjoy crayfish uh, fishing uh, during their childhood. Um, hello, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so let's uh, talk about uh, who is the red fish or the red clappy. So it is native to the southern United States and northeastern part of Mexico. And it aggressively outcompetes the native crayfish made for food or habitat. It has barrowing uh, like behavior. And it's also comparatively larger in size and uh, reproduces faster than most of the native species giving in all the necessary requirements to be uh, an uh, invasive species. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, so as you can see in the picture, uh, this is an invasive history of the red swamp crayfish. So it uh, it has been uh, like the gray, dark gray area is where it's been native to, and the red spots you see across the map is where it has been introduced as invasive species. And thus the spread began. It's now a cosmopolitan kind of presence. And for most reasons, it's uh, for its economic value, it has been introduced in almost every call. Yeah. All right, now we will look into the existing monitoring methodologies. There are several ways which can be used to detect the crayfish nowadays. For example, it can be tracking, it can be direct observation, as well as it can be through environmental DNA or eDNA. However, there are problems associated with each of these methods. For example, when it comes to tracking and observation, it is number one, extremely time consuming as well as it is very labor intensive. Likewise, when we will talk about environmental DNA or eDNA, one of the major problems is it is expensive. And since we need to collect the sample and send it and then wait for the analysis, therefore, at times it takes a lot of time to get the results. So we want to frugalize the whole process. Yes. So essentially, we decided that we wanted to monitor a sort of frugal remote monitoring device that can provide a notification system to preserve managers, especially biological preserves, for a sort of low cost um, and low density crayfish detection. So when crayfish just begin to arrive in an ecosystem, can you manage to detect them before they actually become a problem? Um, and we decided basically if we're detecting crayfish early, we want to target when they're smaller and less likely to be seen and less of a problem. And so we decided to target the juvenile part of the crayfish life cycle when they are also free swimming. Um, and the juvenile crayfish are essentially miniaturized versions of adult crayfish. And they're pretty small. They're about a millimeter big. And based on this, we kind of came up with a set of design specifications we wanted our device to follow. It has to be able to effectively monitor high throughput area where a lot of water and a lot of biological material is passing through, which also means they can monitor plankton-like organisms. These aren't ex exactly a planktonic stage, but they are free swimming like plankton. It has to be able to identify juvenile crayfish, um, which are pretty small. They're about a millimeter big. And necessarily, since this is an aquatic invasive species, it has to be waterproof and require minimal maintenance. And this is the juvenile crayfish. 
So based on this, we kind of came up with a two-part system of sampling and detection. We decided to kind of build on the anglerfish model to create an anglerfish-like frugal underwater camera setup that essentially is an underwater camera trap that images a habitat. And we created sort of two prototypes of this one over here, one in Germany with Chuzo. And then we developed an ML model that can basically identify red swamp crayfish observed in images. And this is also something we began to prototype. Um, yeah. And we, um, Shuza and I also went out and did some field work to kind of look at the habitats where crayfish are found and understand what are kind of the, some of the monitoring challenges that might arise. So I went to Jasper Ridge just down the road and took some videos inside streams to kind of understand what would it take to create a tool that would be useful to preserve managers at Jasper Ridge for monitoring crayfish. Um, and Shuzo. <laughs> So, and um, we also conducted field work uh, in urban river areas in Dresden, Germany, uh, where invasive crayfish is present. And to design a low cost sampling device, uh, we developed a prototype which is composed of a uh, Raspberry Pi and a camera and transparent waterproof box. And briefly, we put the uh, Raspberry Pi and camera and battery inside a transparent box, and we put them in the water for the recording. And here's an example image uh, taken from our local devices. Uh, we successfully captured the interior liver. And however, uh, so far we are not able to find any equid species uh, during recording. So the detection is a future work. And from the for the detection part, uh, we aim to develop the machine learning model to classify the juvenile crayfish. And as a first step, uh, we focus on the binary yeah. classification pro problem to distinguish the crayfish-like species from other species. And since uh, the data set specific design for juvenile crayfish is not available, so we focus on the data set of the fresh water macroinvertebrates, which is publicly available. Um, now we select two different species, which uh, one is a crayfish-like and the other one is not. And then we build a simple um, ML model, which has three layers. And the first layer is uh, the uh, input uh, with image and output is two levels. And also uh, it is uh, quite simple. I mean, like I the model successfully distinguished the uh, uh, clay fish like species with others. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, artificial setting level <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just give him a second. Uh, yeah, no problem. And yeah, sample image will be shown. Yeah, um, go ahead. You can continue. Yeah, Shujo, go ahead. Okay, and we have some some progress. So just briefly, yeah, like this. Yes. Yeah. And based on our field work, we also realized this pipeline wasn't complete. Um, it's a high throughput environment, which means there's a lot of water to sample in order to actually detect any crayfish. We went out several times to these rivers and didn't see not even a crayfish, not even a single fish. So there's some kind of filtration or concentration device that you need to maximize the likelihood you're actually going to find something, anything. And so we kind of started designing a filtration setup that can concentrate macro invertebrate and macro vertebrate populations in these rivers. Um, it's a really, really basic design that's essentially modeled off a crayfish trap, but the idea is the trap can be open periodically to release everything that's in there before it's imaged. So essentially, it's maximizing the likelihood that you will detect something that you actually want to see. Um, and we haven't got a chance to build it yet, but we sort of began imagining what it might look like and what it might need. Um, in terms of next steps, there's a lot to be done, and we're kind of very excited to continue this work. Um, we need to kind of think a little bit more about what does it mean where you sample, also make this device a little smaller and lower cost. It currently costs about 100 bucks. Um, we need to improve our ML model, obviously, for more complex classification tasks. It's difficult to access juvenile crayfish imagery. A lot of it is confidential and researchers don't share it. So we're trying to get access to that um, and improve the object segmentation as the earlier team also discussed. And finally build a pipeline that connects the images we sample from our device to the ML model that we've created. And finally, like thinking a little bit more about the filtration device and what it actually might look like and testing it because that's still a very open question, but it's just something we think might be important going forward. And yeah, very grateful to everyone who supported us um, in this project and thank you and yeah. What was the illumination? I think I was surprised. Maybe that was done in the day because one of the challenges of underwater images is getting the light 
Yeah. That's why Anglerfish has been dangling the light some time. Those two videos, yeah. they're just ambient illumination. That is ambient illumination, yeah. And our imaging was honestly pretty good, especially in Shuzo's locations. Um, in Jasper Ridge, it was a little bit more turbid. It was a little bit more difficult. Um, I think that would be a, it, 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 a variation. That yeah, exists. it would be a variation that exists. I think it's also important because crayfish are pretty crepuscular animals. Um, juvenile crayfish tend to be active more throughout the day. Adult crayfish are more crepuscular, but maximizing the likelihood might also mean more crepuscular work. So I think illumination is another part that could pretty easily be added, I think, into the box that we're currently doing. Yeah. But these are pretty, we're thinking of shallow, fast-growing rivers right now. So it hopefully makes our, our, our goal a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think in terms of thinking about the volume, it's fantastic to just have some of this incorporated in the system as well. Yeah. Do a orders of magnitude, but for macro stuff, it does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Your depth of focus yeah. can be large. Yeah. And you know, one of the threads is that it pushes in the direction of monitoring in general if crayfish is only one target. You would see a lot of other good yeah. stuff in yeah. a system like this to quantify yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, places like Jasper's would be so easily applied to like steelhead trout and stuff like that. Like these large animals that people are kind of looking for, but are having a lot of difficulty finding and that are important to figure out. And I think the idea is that this could be a device that could be sort of extended towards any kind of aquatic invasive species that's above a certain yeah, size threshold. That is actually that. Yeah. Because there might be some low hanging fruits yeah. while you develop them to get to hitting the fish. Yeah. You will see a lot of things eventually. Yeah. 